Thank you, Cindy. What a beautiful voice. So blessed to have that. Good morning. If you are visiting with us, we are so grateful that you have chosen to come here and worship with us this morning. Uh, it, it's a great day. It's a great way to start our week. And we are in chapter 2 of an amazing book over in the Old Testament. We started last week on Jonah, and we're going to be walking over the next few weeks. And we saw in Jonah chapter 1 how this prophet, who by all accounts should have a very close relationship with God, and how it shouldn't surprise him when God calls him to go do something, and he should be more than willing to go and embrace what God is asking him to do. But what we saw is that's not what happened. God told Jonah, hey, I want you to go to Nineveh, and I want you to share with a group of people a message of love and grace. And Jonah said, nope, not going to do it, and basically threw a temper tantrum because God was asking him to step into his faith and go do something. And so he threw a temper tantrum uh, to express that he didn't like what God was calling him to do. He gave in to his rebellious side, and he attempted to run away from God. And as we saw last week, that didn't quite work out the way Jonah had hoped. As it seldom does, when we run away from God or try to distance ourselves from the Father or try to run in the opposite direction of what he's trying to have us do, it rarely goes the way we are hoping. It rarely goes the way we think. And the reason why is because God wants us to do this. We're going in the opposite direction. God is not wanting this. This is not his plan. And so it falls apart. And what happened to Jonah? He got tossed into the sea. And that's where we're going to pick up this morning. But as we start into Jonah, I want to encourage us to, if there is something that you're going through in your life right now that is a tough trial, if God's calling you to go do something and you're battling whether God is, whether you're going to give in to that, and so you decide, you know, I, I just, I need that control in my life, and you try to put that distance and you start to feel that things are just falling apart and slipping away, and you start to feel like you're on this downhill slide, and nothing is going right in your life. As we read through the text this morning, I want to encourage you that, you know, even in the depths of the bottoms that we can be in, we can have the most richest and most fulfilling moments with God. Because it's when we hit rock bottom, it's when we hit that level of despair that we're quiet and we're still and we're listening to God. And we're going to see how Jonah is going to have that kind of an encounter this morning. When Jonah went into the sea and he gets swallowed up by the fish, something changes in him. He doesn't go, come out the same way he goes in. Let's look at the final verse of chapter 1 and then we're going to dive into the first verse of chapter 2. It says, The Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of that fish. Jonah finds himself in a predicament here. The one that is trying to run away from God now has nowhere to run. The one who said, I'm in control of what I do, how I do, when I do it, is realizing he's not in control. And he's kind of in this solitary confinement. It's him alone in this fish. It's him alone in the belly of despair. It's him alone in the belly of sadness. It's him alone in the belly of going, I don't know where to turn. But Jonah, even in the midst of that, remembers one crucial thing. And that is that he can always turn to the one who will never let him down. And that's the Father. That's going to God. His life was so packed with excitement up until this point. He was running the opposite direction. He was going to Tarshish. He was jumping on a boat. He was going out into sea. He was trying everything he could to get away from God. He was doing everything he could to keep his life busy. He was doing everything he could to try to hold on to that sense of control. And then God says, you know what? You and me, we need to talk. And the events that followed made it to where Jonah had nowhere to go but to sit and listen to God. You know, in our life, it becomes very hectic. 
We run around schedule to schedule, meeting to meeting, moment to moment, event to event. And sometimes we struggle with finding that time, carving that intentional time to sit and talk to God. And we come up with all kinds of excuses. I can't do it. I can't fit it in my schedule. I don't have time to sit and, and read through your word. I don't have time to go to worship. I don't have time to go to church. I don't have time to go minister to these people you're calling me to go to. I don't have time to go on a mission trip. I don't have time to sit and have a conversation with you, God. Because if you saw my schedule, man, I'm, just, I'm busy from moment to moment. I get up, I go to bed. I'm busy every day. And every once in a while in our hecticness, Things seem to quiet down for us. And that's God taking things off of our plate and going, look, you and I, we need to talk. You have been distant. And you need me in your life. Jonah gets quieted. He gets in this confinement. And he has a moment with God. God slows things down for Jonah. And you would think, okay, well, Jonah, what are you going to do? You've, you've had everything fall apart on you. You've had every bit of control taken away from you. What are you going to do? And the one thing he does is goes and prays to God. And you would think, okay, you know what? He's a prophet. He's got a relationship with the Father. Of course he's going to go and pray. Okay, look at our lives. We're Christians. We're believers. Of course we're going to pray. When's the last time you stopped and fell on your knees and prayed to God? When's the last time that you stopped and said, God, you're in control of my life. My hope is we do that every day, multiple times a day. But the truth is we don't. And Jonah didn't do that. And was missing all in chapter 1. The pagan sailors cried out to their gods. The captain of the boat came to Jonah who was cowering in the depths of the boat and said, get up and pray to your God. Jonah never did. That's why the beginning of this verse, of this chapter, is so powerful. Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He knew, hey, everything has fallen apart. I've been messing up. I've blown it. And I need to go to the one person who's never let me down. I need to go to the one relationship I can always count on. I need to go to the one source that I know will feed me, will take care of me, will protect me. That's my rock, that's my refuge. And that's God. And so he goes to God. Have you ever messed up in your life? I mean, absolutely, you have blown it. And you think, man, there's no way God will forgive me for what I've done. There's no way that I'm worthy of the love and grace that he gives. There's no way people are going to forgive me that I've wronged. I've disappointed people. They're not going to forgive me. They're not going to move past that. I've messed up way too much. Well, listen, God is always faithful. He is always there. He is always loving. He is always gracious. And he will provide exactly what you need to bring him back into your life at the center of it. He pursues us even when we don't want to be pursued. He pursues us before we ever even need, no, we need it pursuing. He's waiting on us to turn around to him. And that's exactly what Jonah is doing in this chapter. He's going to turn to God. Let's pick up in verse 2. It says, I called to the Lord in my distress, and he answered me. I cried out for help from deep inside Sheol. You heard my voice. When you threw me into the depths, into the heart of the seas, the current overcame me. All your breakers and your billows swept over me. And I said, I have been banished from your sight. Yet I will look once more toward your holy temple. The water engulfed me up to the neck. The watery depths overcame me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. I sank to the foundations of the mountains. The earth's gates shut behind me forever. Then you raised my life from the pit. Lord, my God. As my life was fading away, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came to you, to your holy temple. When you pray to the Father, how honest are you in your prayers? Do you get raw? Do you get real? Do you get emotional? Do you say, you know what, God, I've messed up. And I'm looking to you. I'm looking to you for guidance. I'm looking to you for love. I'm looking to you for what I need. 
That's what Jonah's doing. He's saying, look, I messed this up. My life has become turmoil. And I'm looking to you. And I want you in my life. The same prophet who was stubborn, who was running away from what God has called him to do, turning his back on Nineveh, running to the port of Joppa, jumping on a boat going to Tarshish, cowering in the bottom of the boat, and trying to hide, is now sitting in the belly of a fish with nowhere to go and looking to God. And God is going to reach out to him. You know, you just can't get any lower than where Jonah is. You just can't. And the term that we use in our modern day language is rock bottom. I've hit rock bottom. I've lost everything in my life. Everything has gone away. And God reaches us at the depths and gets us back. What does it take for you to get that real with God? What does it take in your life to get you to a point where you go to God this day? What does it take for you to carve out that intentional time with God? I guarantee you nothing you could ever say to God will surprise him. He's all-knowing. He's all-loving. He knows everything that we have ever done in our life and continues to do in our life. There's nothing you could ever say or do that's going to surprise him. And he loves us through it all. But it comes to us taking the time to say four little words. God, I need you. God, I need you. Jonah is crying out to God and saying, I need you in my life. I'm pointing my eyes towards you. My heart is going back up to you. I called out to the Lord in my distress and he answered me. God, I need you. These are very powerful words, and they go hand in hand with three other ones. I love you. God, I need you, and I love you. Think about those words in your day-to-day life. If you're married, if you've got kids, if you've got grandkids, if you've got great-grandkids, do you spend time walking around the house going, eh, they know how I feel about them, I don't need to say the words. And you just go about through motions, never expressing how you feel. Never saying, you know what, I'm glad you're in my life. Never saying, I love you more than anything. Of course you don't. And the reason why you don't is because there's something powerful about those words. There's something powerful that happens inside of our lives when we say, I need you, and I love you, and I'm glad you're in my life. There's something meaningful that happens in our life and in the lives of those individuals. And if we will do that with our families, why won't we do it with God? Why won't we take the time to go to God, to verbalize our feelings? There's a rawness, there's a realness that's happening. Jonah is in the belly of the fish. In the darkest of times, he is crying out, God, I need you. And he has come to the point where he's facing the reality of his situation. And he looks to God for leadership and for protection. He looks to God, his rock and his refuge, instead of holding on to that illusion of control. When we end up living a life that is filled with control instead of looking to God, when we live a life in which we're trying to do everything that we want to do versus what God is calling us to do, we end up living a life of inconsistency. We end up living a life of judgment. We end up living a life of hypocrisy. We form shallow relationships with each other and with God. And we start playing this kind of religious game. Jonah's playing this game. Hey God, I love you. I worship you. He says in chapter 1, I love God. I praise God. I worship God. Oh, you want me to do what? No, no, no. Can't do it. Mm -mm. It goes against everything I, I stand for. Nope, can't do it. It goes against my business. Can't do it. Peter does that. When you look over the New Testament, God, I love you. I'm never going to be ashamed of you. And what happens? Hey, aren't you with him? Nope. I don't know what you're talking about. And he denies him one, two, three times, right? It's a religious game. And when we live our life without speaking to God, without going to him with rawness, without spending our time telling God, hey, I need you and I love you, 
and doing what he is calling us to do, we're playing the exact same game that Jonah and Peter did. And it affects those around us. And it affects our life. How does it play out in our life? God, I love you, but I can't go share the gospel with these people because I don't get along with them. God, I love you, but you know I'm only going to go to a church whenever it feels comfortable to me, when it's convenient, when I can fit it into my schedule. God, I love you, and I'm grateful for you, but you know what? I just don't have time to spend reading your word. God, I love you, and I'm so proud of, uh, so proud of the fact that I'm your child. But you know what? My life is too busy. I, I don't have time to stop and pray. It's a religious game. And we all play it on some level. Jonah is helping us to see that we are never too busy to go to God. Because if we are, then God's going to quiet our schedules. God's going to humble us if we don't humble ourselves. Let's look at verse 8. Such a simple but yet profound verse. Those who cherish worthless idols abandon their faithful love. Those who cherish worthless idols abandon their faithful love. How many of you have ever been to a zoo? Go ahead, raise your hand. How many of y'all have ever been to, uh, yeah, quite a few of you. When you go to the zoo, is there one particular animal that you go, man, I just love to see him every time I go? For me, there's two animals. My all-time favorite animal is the otter. I just love watching the otters. They're so full of excitement, so full of energy. And the way they have their relationships is so cool. Because when an otter sleeps, he holds the hand of his mate. They hold hands laying on their back and sleeping. There's a love there. Their offspring, they cuddle on their chest and embrace there's a love. There's a needness there. Energetic, outgoing, fun-loving, but so full of love. I love watching the otters. The other animal is a little bit on the opposite side. It's the monkey. I love watching the monkeys. One, they're energetic. They're smart. They figure out things that we can't figure out, which is weird to say that. But think about how you, how you open a banana. How many of you open the banana, and I know Christy and I disagree a little bit on this one, but when you hold a banana, how many of you where the stem comes out, that's how you open a banana? Yeah, that's not the way, is it? Flip it upside down. Flip it upside down. The reason why is because, you know, those nasty little strings that come off of a banana, they're not there when you open it from the bottom. Plus, you get this really cool little handle to hold it. You ever watched a monkey in a zoo? That's how they hold it. They're so smart, and they figure these things out. But at the same time, they're not so bright. I'll tell you what I mean. Everybody do me a favor. For the next several minutes, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to take whatever hand you want. I don't care which one it is. And I want you to make a fist. And you can hold it out in front of you. You can hold it on your lap. You can hold it up high. I don't care. But make a fist and hold on tight to that fist. Whatever hand you want to use, just make that fist. And keep that fist for the next few minutes. I got a buddy of mine in Africa. His name is Sean. He went over to be a teacher in Africa. And he said, you know, monkeys are interesting creatures. And I said, yeah, they are. I enjoy going to the, to the zoo all the time. He goes, no, I'm talking about in the wild. He said, you know how you catch a monkey? You need three items. Three items and three items only, and you can capture any monkey out in the wild. A jar, either a banana or some nuts, and a net. That's all you need is a jar, a banana, or some nuts, and a net. And what happens is that monkey will stick his hand in the jar to get whatever that is, the banana or the nuts. And they grab it with their hand because they've got to pull it out of the jar. And they're sitting there trying to figure out how to get it out of that thing. And the hunter comes up and drops a net. Now you would think, okay, monkey, run, hide. Let go of what's in the jar and save yourself. Turn to freedom. But they're so engulfed in what is inside that jar that they would rather sacrifice their freedom 
than lose what they got a hold of. They want what's in that jar. It's tempting for them what's in that jar. And the hunter captures them with that net. You know, sometimes in our life, we're holding on to something so tight that we can't receive the love of God. It's there. But we can't grasp it. Why? Because we've got this. Whatever's in this hand, whatever's in that fist, is what you consider something that draws your attention, something that's important to you, that you would rather hold on to than lose. Whatever is in this hand, some of us, it's, it's an idol that we hold on to. It's our phones, it's our technology, it's, it's a temptation to sin. Whatever it is in your life is in that fist. And you would rather spend a life away from God than give this up. In order to embrace the love of God, you've got to open that fist. You've got to drop whatever's there. And then you have open hand to embrace God. The monkey needs to let go of what he's holding on to in order to receive freedom. We need to let go of what we're holding on to in order to receive the love of God. In order to receive the grace of the Father. You know, I've been in ministry... 14, 15 years, love every day of it. And I've gone on tons and tons of mission trips and fun trips. And I'm, it's something y'all don't know about me, I'm a meticulous packer. When I'm packing for a trip, everything is folded neatly and it's placed in the bags and it needs to be a certain way. I pack certain things in first and then the others in order to make sure everything fits. And I go on this trip. When I come home, it's not that way. When I come home, I'm grabbing, I'm shoving, I'm packing because I want to get home. I'm tired, I'm exhausted, I'm dirty, I want to get home. And so I shove everything back in the bag. And most of the time, as I was going from trip to trip, I would come in, I'd drop one bag, I'd pick up another one. And I'd take off for another trip. And then a little while later, I'd be going, where's that bag? Oh, it's over there. Okay. I pick it up, and I go to pack, and I realize I never unpacked the old stuff. I never took that out of the bag. you got to take that out in order to put the new stuff in. In our lives, we have stuff that we're holding on to. For Jonah, it was control. I want control. And his control was fueled by anger. His control was fueled by a certain group of people he didn't want to go talk to. But he had to let that go in order to receive what God had for him. And it took God sitting him down and saying, hey, you and me, we need to talk. For Jonah to relinquish the control and turn to God and say, God, I need you. I love you. And I want you in my life. Proverbs 28, 13 says, The one who conceals his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them will find mercy. Whoever conceals their sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them will find mercy. Your sin, whatever that is in your life, and I want want you to hear me, we are all broken. We are all sinners. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. That's why we need the Savior. That's why we need God in our lives. Because we can't do it on our own. Your sin, whatever that is in your life, is not greater than God's grace. There is nothing you can ever do that would reject the love of the Father. There's nothing you can ever do that would replace it. There's nothing you could ever do that the love and grace of God can't cover. If you're sitting there thinking, yeah, but you don't understand. I've messed up bad. I've messed up so bad. And I've been holding it in. And I can't let it go. Because I'm afraid of what people are going to say. I'm afraid of what people are going to think. I'm afraid God's not going to love me. Because I, I just, I don't deserve it. Then your view of God is too small. 
Because God loves you more than anything. And he is welcoming you with open arms. Every single one of us have a, has a story of how God has reached into your life and brought you to him. Every single one of us has a story. Some, it's been faint whispers. Some, it's been two-by-fours across the head. Some, you feel like you've been run over by a bulldozer. But there's a story in how God has reached you and brought you here. You're here this morning for a reason. There's something God wanted you to hear. There's something he wants to do in your life. And he's brought you through those doors for a reason. For Jonah, his deepest spiritual lesson came during his lowest of lows, sitting in the belly of a fish down in the ocean. There were some walls that needed to come down. There were some failures that needed to be overlooked. Do you have walls around you right now? Is there something you're shutting people out from? Is there something you're holding in that fist that you're unwilling to give up? Is there something in your life that needs to be overcome? God is our refuge and our strength. God is our refuge and our strength. And he is present in our lives, and his grace alone is sufficient. His grace alone covers it all. We need to be willing to experience it. We need to be willing to open up and say, God, I need you, and I love you. Jonah didn't want to embrace it. In fact, Jonah resisted it. And then the sequence of events that took place after that, one after another, God was pursuing him. Now, you may be sitting there going, I'm not in the belly of a fish, Pastor. You're probably not. It's probably very rare that any of us would end up there. But I guarantee you're in the belly of something. You're in the belly of despair. You're in the belly of cynicism. You're in the belly of pride. You're in the belly of something. And God's trying to reach you to pull you out of that. You know, Jonah was called to go to Nineveh to preach the good news to a group of people. And Jonah turned away from it. And he's like, no. Who is your Nineveh? Who is your Nineveh? What's the mission that God is calling you to do? There are a lot of people in our world that don't know who God is. There are a lot of people in our world that have never experienced the love and grace of God. Our backyard is our Nineveh. Our community is our Nineveh. Our country, our state, our world is our Nineveh. Our homes are our Nineveh. Who's God calling you to go reach? Our schools, our workplaces are our Nineveh. There are a lot of people who need to know who Jesus is. There are a lot of people that are skeptical when they hear a story like Jonah. Could that ever happen? Well, here's a couple of thoughts. Number one, there's secular stories, meaning non-Christian stories, that talk about Jonah. They talk about what took place. And Jesus puts an exclamation on it in the New Testament, in Matthew chapter 12, starting in verse 38. Then some of the scribes and the Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. And he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation demands a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was in the belly of the huge fish three days and three nights, so the, man of God, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at Jonah's preaching and look, something is greater than Jonah right here. Something is greater than Jonah. Jesus affirms what happened in Jonah, but brings a challenge. And that challenge is for us to receive the word, to receive Christ, to believe and embrace him. We're probably never going to be in the belly of a fish, 
but we're going to be in the belly of something. There's a storm coming. Every one of us goes through times. But guess what? Just like Jonah came out the other way, the other side, in a different change, we're going to come out the other side. We enter these storms and we feel like they're overtaking us. We feel like there's no hope. But there is. There's something on the other side. Jonah. God pursues Jonah. And we see when we read through the book of Jonah that God's hand is there every step of the way. Orchestrating, guiding, working through. Even all the way to the point that we see Jonah coming back on the dry land. Jonah gets called to go do something and he rebels. God sends a storm. Jonah goes into the water. God calms the storm. God sends a fish. God puts Jonah inside the fish. God sustains Jonah. And then God has the fish vomit him up. Oof. It's kind of a weird thought. I was talking to Mitchell earlier. I'm like, can you imagine me standing on the beach? And all of a sudden you see, there goes Jonah. You would think you've been on the beach too long. God keeps doing one miraculous thing after another. And it changes the heart of the prophet. When you think about what's most important in life, don't worry so much about what others think. Don't worry so much about your reputation. Don't worry so much about your resume. Don't worry so much about pleasing man. Please God. Please God. And everything else will fall into place. We are not called to please man. We're called to please God. That's why we say, God, may the, the meditation of our hearts be pleasing to you. May the words of our mouth be pleasing to you. It's why we gather together and say, God, we need you in our lives. Please come. We love you. We're thankful for you. Please, God. And everything else will happen. Look at verse 9. But as for me, I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. I will fulfill what I have vowed. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Such an incredible turnaround is taking place in Jonah's life. Jonah was having an intense and real emotional moment inside the belly of this fish. It just wasn't good intentions. It was meaningful. It wasn't, well, God, you know what, I'll try. Well, God, maybe next time. Well, God, eh, I, I, I don't know, I'll think about it. No, he says, I will follow through. I will go to Nineveh. I will preach. I will do what you're asking me to do. You know, the Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and since we have the same spirit of faith in keeping with what is written, I believe, therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. For we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you. Indeed, everything is for your benefit, so that as grace extends through more and more people, it may cause thanksgiving to be increased to the glory of the Lord. God didn't need to remember Jonah. Jonah remembered, needed to remember God, and he does in the belly. Verse 7, as my life was fading away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you, your holy temple. God, my life is drifting away. I've grown distant from you. God, I've messed up. God, I've gotten busy. I've let things interfere with my relationship with you. God, I'm struggling in life. I've given in to temptation. I've given in to sin. I've given in to this control factor. I've wanted self-righteousness. I've wanted people to know who I am. And I've put that above you. God, I've done all these things. And there's a barrier. And God, I need you in my life. I need you to break that down. I need you to come and shower me with your love and grace. That's what Jonah's doing. That's what we need to be willing to do. 
I've been looking at the ship. I've been looking at the sailors. I've been looking at the captain, what I should have been doing. Was looking at you. I've been looking at my bank account. I've been looking at my job. I've been looking at all these material things. I've been looking here and there and everywhere in the world. I've been looking to have friends. I've been looking to have a popularity. And what I should have been doing was looking for you. What I should have been doing was looking at you. I'm ready, God. I'm teachable. You ever had an experience where you have to tell somebody once, twice, three, four, five times, and finally, down the road, you go, ha, oh, you got it. Maybe that's you. Maybe God's been trying to get your attention for a long time. Are you going to react the way Jonah did when he was at rock bottom? And look and go, God, you know, all this stuff you've been telling me, all this stuff you've been pointing towards me, and I'm coming to you. And I'm reaching back to you. Then the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. He's hurled out onto the land. I bet that ground never tasted or felt so sweet. To land on solid ground. You know, God calms the storms in our life. He provides opportunities for us to grow closer to him. He picks us up off of our despair, out of our despair, out of our struggles, out of our weakness, and puts our feet firmly on solid ground. How does it feel when you feel connected to God? How does it feel when you're pulled in close? And receiving his grace. Thomas Aquinas, which was a respected philosopher in his day, said this one time. The splendor of a soul in grace surpasses the beauty of all created things. Grace, when we receive it, is attached to purpose. And Jonah had received grace. And he received a purpose. Go and preach to Nineveh. Go to tell the story. Go to share the love and the grace with a group of people. What is your purpose? What is your mission field? What is your Nineveh that God is trying to, trying to get you to reach? Every single one of us can think of one person in our lives who needs Jesus. One person. I mean, sure, we've got many of them, but there's one person that I'm sure if we stopped and thought, we'd go, yeah, that's the person that needs Jesus the most. Well, guess what? God's calling you to go reach that person. He's given you the ability to go do it. He's filled you with his love and grace for your life and for theirs. Go and share the message. Go and be preaching to Nineveh. Let's pray. God, we come to you this morning to say thank you. Thank you so much for how you meet us in the depths of our situations. And you communicate with us. You're patient with us. God, we know that we're stubborn and we're silent. We cry out to you when it looks like there's no hope, when we're running on empty. And you bring hope back into our lives. God, we praise you today for your grace, for your love, for your mercy. It's never ceasing. God, we just ask that you work in our hearts so that we're ready to reach the lost and the lonely in our city and around the world. God, we pray that if there's anyone in here today who doesn't yet know who you are or what a relationship with you looks like, or God, if, if there's somebody in here that says, you know what, I've messed up, I've been distant, and it's time, it's time that I stop, that I make things right. I need to go back. I need to remember who God is. God, I need you and I love you. God, I, I pray that they don't wait another moment, but that they open their hearts to you tonight. That they say, God, please come into my life. I'm a sinner. I'm broken. 
I have failed in numerous ways. But God, I know that your love and your grace and your mercy is covering me. And I need it. Our God, I've heard about who you are and I need you in my life. God, I pray they don't wait another moment but open their arms and receive that gift of love. God, we, we're hurting and the world around us is hurting and it needs you. Help us to not run another moment but to turn and to embrace the calling you've put on our lives to go reach those individuals, to go reach our Ninevehs. God, we love you. We need you, and we're thankful for all that you do for us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. As we go into our final song, uh, the, the altar will be open. This is a time where you can come and you can stand, you can kneel, you can sit, you can just spend that time with God, you can do it where you're sitting. But don't waste this moment. Talk to God. Tell Him what's on your heart. And receive the love and grace back. If you need prayer, if you need somebody to talk to, I'm right down in front here. Come and say, hey, Pastor, I'd like some prayer. Or, hey, can I get with you this week? I got a conversation I need to have. Then let's do it. Let's do it. If you're interested in joining this, this body of believers, we'd love to have you as part of our family. You come and, and you say, hey, Pastor, I want to join Thompsonville First Baptist because God's doing some powerful things here, and I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of 2023 here. I want to be a part of the future. I want to be a part of taking that gospel into the world. Then what we'll do is we're going to pray, and then you and I are going to get together, and we're going to have a conversation because I want to know who you are, and I want you to know who we are. And then, you feel that calling still? Come join us. We'd love to have you. But we're going to sit down and have that conversation. But it starts with you first saying, I'm ready. Are you ready? Today's the day. tell you what, I love coming together as a family. I love coming together and starting our week off praising God and realizing that, you know, without him, we'd be lost. Without him, we just, we'd be in a hurt. God loves us and he has reached out, he has sent his son for us and calling us to go tell the world about it. What a joy that is to be a part of. What a blessing to know that we get to be his vessels in this world. To share his love and his grace and point people to him. Man, what a joy. What a joy that is. We should be shouting that from the rooftops going, guess what? I'm a child of God and I get to do this. Cool. I'm excited. And 2023 is full of a lot of excitement. Every year is going to be full of excitement. But I'm excited about 2023 because that's what's on our doorstep right now. And this coming Wednesday, I hope to see you guys here because I'm going to express what the vision and mission that God has put on my heart for us here in Thompsonville. 
And I'd love for you to come and be a part of that to hear what God has to say with that. So please make it a point to be here this Wednesday at 6.30 uh, right in here for our business meeting. Yeah, we're going to talk about some business of the church, but I guarantee it's important business. It's things you need to hear. It's things you need to know. And we're going to talk about the vision and the mission for the church. It's going to be a great week. Remember, 6 o'clock tonight right in here as we start off the book of Ruth. Then Wednesday for our business meeting and vision sharing. Hope to see you guys there. Uh, Brother Isaac, would you close us in a word of prayer?